Hello and welcome to you all. My name is Sasha Powell and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Froebel Trust and your Chair for this event. This evening we're proud and pleased to be launching our latest pamphlet, Sewing with Young Children. This is the 11th pamphlet in the Frobelian Approach series, which Dr. Jane Reed has been editing for with great care and dedication, and I want to say a big thank you to Jane. The pamphlet's authors, Sharon Imray, Tracy Thompson and Jane Winnett, are very exper experienced Frobelian educators, and we're delighted that they've pulled their expertise for the creation of this informative pamphlet about the Frobelian occupation of sewing for contemporary early childhood education and care. It's also my great pleasure to welcome and thank Esme Young for agreeing to join us. I'm sure Esme needs no introduction. Uh, like me, no doubt many of you have reveled in watching her central role in the great British Sewing Bee programmes on the BBC. I say she needs no introduction because audience demand for the sewing bee is apparently four times that of the average UK TV series and it sits on the 98th percentile in the reality TV genre. So in other words it's hugely popular. Together tonight Esme, Jane, Tracy and Sharon will share their enthusiasm for sewing and their stories and their advice about nurturing that enthusiasm and skill in others, especially young children, but also adults who may be new to this occupation. Jane and Esme will start with a conversation, after which Jane will be joined by Sharon and Tracy to introduce their pamphlet. We'll have time for questions later, so if you'd like to ask anything, please type your questions in the Q&A box. I'm now going to hand over straight away to Jane Winnett and Esme Young and invite them to start our webinar with a conversation. Thank you both. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I'm going to start with a slight apology because you're going to hear that my voice is not great tonight. So I'm really sorry that you're going to have to listen to my voice um, in this croaky fashion. However, it's really lovely to um, see so many people coming up in the chat from all over the world, not just from UK. So, um, and I'm particularly delighted this evening to be joined by Esme Young. Um, Esme, it's been it's a real pleasure to have you here this evening. Um, I've been a great admirer of the uh, sewing bee and um, very recently in the summer I came to North Berwick to hear you speak in a Ooh. huge tent. Um, oh gosh, and, yes. Yes. Um, I was quite scared about that. When <laughs> I saw the tent I would think, oh my god, how huge <laughs> is that? What if there's only 30 people there? <laughs> but it was sold out, actually. There was, a, I think there were a thousand people in that tent. I know. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. So, um, it, you know, this this was the book that you had brought um, uh, that day to talk about. And it was um, a really inspiring uh, talk about your journey uh, in sewing, right from when you were a small child, um, right until um, today. And it's certainly been an adventurous uh, and creative uh, journey. So I thought maybe we would start right back at the beginning and um, you very kindly give me some photographs to share. So I'll maybe pop those up on the screen and you can maybe tell us a bit about the photograph. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, so as I look at the screen, the one on the left with me in the smock dress, that was made by my mum. And when I was born, um, my mother and her friends all sewed and they would get clothes made for them as well. In fact, I've even got, still got a dress that my mother had made for her. I think in the 50s, and it's a lace dress, it's fantastic. I could 
not get into it now because I'm a little bit larger than my <laughs> mum was. Well, now I am. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the one in the middle is me dressed up in my mum's clothes. And I've got quite a face on there, haven't I? <laughs> <laughs> I made the necklace, which was those popper beads, you know, the yeah. poppers that pop together. And I've got headband on as well. And I obviously thought I was quite special. Don't think the way I'm posing. <laughs> <laughs> and the one on the end is me um, when I don't know how old I was then, but probably three, I think. And I've got dungarees on and I'm giving a hug to a pillar. <laughs> also, I'm on tiptoe. Yeah, I, I, as I say, when I saw that one, I thought of the amorphous dress and wondered oh. if that was an early inspiration for the amorphous dress. Well, maybe it was. I don't know. <laughs> Tell you the truth. The amorphous dress, why we called it the amorphous dress was because when it was not sewn, it was like an amorphous shape. It was <clears> flat. <throat> it was all in one piece. There was just one dart. Incredible. So, yeah, we had quite good names for our, our clothes. The Strangler, the Slasher, you know, <laughs> things like that. <laughs> Very creative. <laughs> yeah, it was fun, I have to say. Yeah, fun, absolutely. So, um, and, uh, and of course, the necklaces have become quite a feature of um, your uh persona on the uh the uh great swing bee well that's true but <laughs> i've i've i bought oh, years ago i saw this necklace in a i think it was in a jumble sale or charity well i think in those days there weren't really charity shops there were jumble sales and i saw this necklace that was be wooden beads so there was yellow, blue, green, and red. And it really reminded me of a necklace I'd made as a small child. And that's why, God knows what's happened to that, the original, but that's why I bought another one because, and I wear it quite a lot actually. Mm. Yeah. I like it, it's got, yeah. What I one thing about my jewelry, most of it has got stories and connections to my family or friends, or yeah, I mean, not all of it because no. basically I just buy anything that takes my fancy, but it's never any real jewel, you know, it's all cost, yeah, jewelry. yeah. Well, the necklace, I wore my necklace this evening in your honour, um, and this this particular necklace I bought because um, the Frobelian approach that we uh, write about um, it is based on this German educator, and oh. he has educational materials. His first gift were round spheres, small spheres. Oh, wow. So this necklace really reminds me of um, Froebel. Um, so and green's my favourite colour. So that's oh, why it's the green necklace. Uh -huh. So presumably you've got necklaces from all over the world. Yes. Well, from everywhere I've been and mm. fabrics. Mm. I've got so many fabrics under my cutting table, boxes full of fabrics. Because yeah, wherever I've been, I've bought fabric yes. yes and of we, course actually with the beads um you know children uh, very in nurseries that's often the first thing they'll start with is um threading beads you know to uh, as an yeah. early form of um sewing uh before well, they actually mo move on to using a needle i suspect that that's what i did and that's why that necklace had such importance to me when i went to the jumbled sale mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's yeah and when did you start making clothes yourself um well the first actual garment I made was a gathered skirt and I think I was seven but you know before that we did 
cross stitch, embroidery, you know, all sorts of different stitching that, you know, I think what it was is you started with simple things and mm -hmm. using a needle and threading it and, you know, it was big fun. But th yeah, the first thing I ever made was the gathered skirt and it was all hand sewn, no pattern, just a rectangle mm -hmm. uh, across the width and a waistband and that was it, all hand sewn. But also at school, we um, learnt to knit. Mm -hmm. We knitted this jumper, which was two rectangles. And at the bottom, it was rib. In the middle, it was stocking stitch. And at the top, it was moss stitch. So it was mm -hmm. a way of teaching us different kinds of stitches. Yeah. And I made a scarf for a um, charity called Crisis. And I used all those stitches. So that yeah. had big meaning for me as well. Yeah. So would you say that sewing at school inspired you or do, would you say it came from uh, more from home and from um, community? or? Well, I was partially deaf as a child. So I was very, you know, I lived in my own little world in a way. And I was very interested and really into creating things mm -hmm. and I can remember one day coming home from school when I was about four and making this little house for a fairy out of grass and I wove it all together and my mum was going oh come on I was going no the fairy's going to come <laughs> so I loved making things and I mm -hmm. always have and drawing I always yeah. have yeah so I, I mean, it's hard to know when I got into sewing, but I, you know, at mm. school, but also fashion. My mum was mm. quite into fashion. Mm. So I think a lot of that came from her, actually. Yeah, and so many, um, you know, women of, you know, my, my mother's generation made their own clothes. Yeah, uh, very yeah. much so, and yeah. and the generation before, yeah. before that, I've got my um a, a nighty that my granny made oh, for, wow. her, for for her wedding night. Um, oh. the, <laughs> what was that like? Big, oh, <laughs> oh, it felt very modest, <laughs> very, very thick white cotton. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> with 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 some lace, <laughs> but um. Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, it, it was very much a sort of um, learning and companionship, really, um, from, yeah. you know, other women uh, very often. Um, and, I mean, my, my father could turn his hand to, um, he sewed a, a pair of curtains because he decided he, he wanted new new curtains for a particular window. And he just had a look around, found some fabric Um sewed them up and then he decided that they needed to be lined so he would put a, oh. a couple of sheets and line, line them with sheets. And, and did he put weights in the bottom? No. Oh. <laughs> no, just straight up the edge with the sewing machine. But you know it was it was seen as something that um you could do. You know there was yeah, no definitely kind of, hmm? and even before sewing machines were invented um people made stuff by hand mm -hmm. you know and you know people um well there were i suppose you could call them factories where they sewed things by hand but of course yeah. the lighting wasn't great so their sight became not brilliant either yeah um but and one thing i find quite interesting is well probably when I was a child, tailoring was all done by men. Yes. And, um, probably even before I was a child. Mm. But now more and more women are getting into tailoring. Mm. And um, I think that's interesting. I mean, I can tailor, but not men's tailoring. I do women's tailoring, which is a whole different how it's made and all that's completely different than Savile Row or something like yeah. that. But I mean, look at um, how, you know, how successful swanky moats were. And that was all women, wasn't it? 
yes, very, very unusual. It mm -hmm. was four women. And um, so I went to college, I did graphics at college at St. Martin's. And there I met Willie who, Walters, who was doing fashion. I didn't even realize you could do fashion, study it. I had no idea. So I helped her with her final collection. Then we decided to open a shop because there weren't anything in shops we wanted to wear. And we invited someone called Melanie Langer, who'd been at school with Willie, then Judy Dewsbury, who'd been to the Royal College and done menswear. So there were all four of us. And we learned so much from each other. Judy was the one with the most knowledge, actually. But I can remember one day her saying to me, you've got to do it like this. And I went, why? And she went, actually, very good point. Why? <laughs> and that's the thing with sewing and fashion. It mm. does change all the time. Mm. And if you think of those men's suits, those tight fitting men's suits with one button here, and you can see the top of the trouser, that would have been considered really bad sewing. And Com, you know, did all those things with raw edges and all, that would have been, con you know, so you push the boundaries, I think, mm. well, that's what you I used. Think. You used shower curtains. Oh yes, we did. We, we, we used all sorts of fabric from shops that were end of the line. And mm. I had this, I rode a motorbike and I had this all in one, which we sold in the shop as well, um, that was made from, it was leopard skin and it was made from car upholstery. <laughs> <laughs> that must be the ultimate in uh, recycling. You're well ahead of the game there. <laughs> we also used, we did a whole um, collection of candle wick. And so, well, it was because we didn't have much money. Mm. You know, and that's, but for women, very, very unusual. Yes. That there was no man involved. And even nowadays, men are always involved. Men normally do the business side. Mm. I can't say we were that good at business, but... <laughs> It was about but creating. It, it was a real col a collaboration, though. Oh, oh you absolutely. Did. Yeah. It yeah. really was. So yeah. we never said, oh, she designed that or she. We all no. collaborated. Yeah. That's right. You say, you say in your book, the way we worked was a brilliant example of the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. Yes. Um, oh, no, it was, it was, we were a real community. Yes. We really yes. were. And we did two um, musicals. We were asked to um, do a talk at the ICA. They were having talked to lots of fashion designers. So Vivian Westwood, Miss Mouse, I can't remember the others. And so they sat on, you know, in the theatre on the platform and were asked questions. And we decided we didn't want to do that. So we put on this show called Crimes of Passion Fashion. And it was about someone going around murdering people who were wearing swanky moves because they were so jealous. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and then the second one we did was for a new collection and it was to celebrate the new decade, the eighties. And that was called Seems Like a Dream. And that was amazing. We had, mm -hmm. Everyone did it for nothing. We had musicians, we had artists, we had graphic designers, we had shop assistants, singers. I mean, it was fantastic. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Really fun. And then you seem to have a new career when you went on to Central St. Martin's. And, and you talk there about, you know, being a, a teacher and a tutor. Yes, um, it's... It's one thing about being, at, I call it St. Martin's, but it's central St. Martin's, um, is the students are really imaginative. And mm. what I feel is we're enabling them to create their vision. 
we're not saying you've got to do this or you've got to do that. Yeah. We're enabling them to, you know, their yeah. vision, make their vision. And some of them end up as sculptures, sculptors, not sculptures, oh. uh, sculptors, <laughs> musicians. Yeah. So, you know, it's yeah. a certain kind of... Can I, can I read a little bit from your book? I'll oh. just read a little short bit. It says... Okay. The hardest moment is when you have to step back and let them find their own way rather than shoving them too hard in one direction. It's a little like not interfering with nature, but being on hand to observe. I'm lucky that I get to step into the student's journey at various points and at privilege to catch up with how much they have grown and be a small influence in the direction they take. Well, they when I first started teaching at St Martin's, Central St Martin's, um, in the first term, I was kind of going, well, I think you should do it like that. I think, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. and then I thought, actually, no, let them decide how they want to design mm -hmm. or what they want to design. And it's, you know, the students make a real community. And I always say they learn more from each other than they do mm. from us and we learn from them yeah and it's amazing how from their first year to their final year how they really develop yeah it's fantastic brilliant do you know that's exactly the same way we work with young children you know oh, it? allowing them freedom um and giving them guidance when they need it um, yeah. And they learn from each other. So, you know, it's it's so refreshing to hear someone talking about it in, um, you know, higher education um, and, you know, having that creativity and allowing people to um, do, um, you know, uh, learn for themselves, but yes. learn with others. Um, yeah, so. they really learn from each other. They other. really do. And yeah. we learn from them. Yeah. Because they come up with things they want to make, designs, and we have to think, oh my yeah. God, how are we going to do that? How are we going to help them achieve <laughs> that? Yes. Um, we've got a couple of minutes and then I'm, I'm going to invite the other two to join um, to join us. I, the last part I wanted to ask you about was the whole idea about sustainability and, you know, what... Um, you say in your book that you realised, you know, that the fashion industry and the clothing industry um, is the second biggest um, polluter after oil. And, you know, what can we do about it? Um, so I wondered if you wanted to maybe give us a few ideas um, about what we well, can do. You know, like I say, when I was a child, there wasn't a high street like there is now. Mm. And basically there are too many clothes being produced. That is the bottom line. And I know people get a high, you go into the shop and you buy something and you kind of get a high, but how long does it last? Mm -hmm. And will you, you know, some shops where things are so cheap, you think, oh, I, 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 lots of people don't even wear it. Mm -hmm. And it, I do think the whole thing about sustainability and all that is quite difficult to grasp because, you know, in the fashion industry, things are produced that are meant to be sustainable, but because the amount that are produced, they're not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so it gets, it can get very complicated, but basically, mm -hmm. I think we should all buy less. And I've decided not to buy any more clothes at all. Not even. And I don't know if that would be easier for you because you can adjust things more easily than it would be for me. Because <laughs> I might not be able to transform them in the same way that you, I won't have the same skills as you have. Well, I'm sure you will. And what, the how you transform them will be expressing who you are. And that's what I think about making clothes of yourself is you're mm. expressing who you are. Yeah. And I think that's really important, actually. Yeah. We all, you know, express who we are. 
Excellent. I think that's a really good place for us to um, stop for just okay. now. Okay. And um, I'm going to, we, we'll um, see you back um, in a little while for the um, question and answers. But thank you so much, Esme. Well, thank you okay. for inviting me. <laughs> well, that's all. So, um, so good evening. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, so here we have. Um, hopefully, can you see the? Can you see the? Um, yeah. The pamphlet. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. So, um, it's been great working with uh, both um, Sharon and Tracy. Um, they're both um, still um, in practice, and of course, I'm no longer in practice. So, I think sometimes when you're not in practice, you can get um, to the point where you get a bit unrealistic about how things are. So, actually, having uh, people who are um, writing uh, for practitioners who actually are in practice, I think, is really important. So, it's been a real pleasure working with both um, Sharon and um, Tracy, and we're going to hear a bit from each of them um, uh, in a couple of minutes. So um, the pamphlet then, um, which you will I hope have had a chance to see, uh, is on is online. And um, we know when we, I mean, when we wrote it, we know that there are people who will be very much au fait with all of the content of this uh, pamphlet and will have, um, you know, this will be um, something that's not new to them. But really, we were thinking of the audience of people who maybe haven't um, thought about um, sewing. Uh, and particularly a Frobelian uh, approach to sewing. So um, like Esme was saying, doing it for yourself, using your own creative um, ideas. Um, so along with the kind of skill and uh, creativity, we would also want to be thinking about that sustainability. So from my perspective, I'm really thinking about um, sewing from a, a Frobelian point of view. Um, and um, I had a little look back at some of the sort of historical documents that we have. And uh, the, these examples here <clears throat> are from the some of the students' work from the 1900s. Uh, and you can see there that they were, um, you know, it was quite formal practice in um, sewing. Um, so you had um, sewing lines. Uh, which very much fit into that Frobelian sequence of gifts and occupations going from solids like the beads to, um, you know, to two dimensional um, to lines and points. So sewing almost combines those two um, things of points and, um, and lines. And then we can see the different forms of representation in beauty and life and in knowledge. So, um, we can continue to see those kind of things in the in the sewing that children are doing today. There's also a reference to sewing in um, in the uh, in the family songs, the mother songs book, um, and um, we know that the the illustrations in this book really um, showed occupations of um, Froebel's time, living in a rural um, community. And in this particular um, uh, illustration, we can see some children um, sewing. And in the commentary to this um, song, Froebel talks about, um, you know, the uh, children, uh, you know, uh, developing their fingers through the um, finger rhymes uh, in order in the future to be able to sew and uh, plant and, um, and use their fingers in other ways. So it also um, links to, um, you know, those Frobelian principles about relationships, just what um, Esme was talking about, those relationships with um, other children, with your own family, with your culture, because actually um, the culture that you come from will have some fabrics that are particularly important um, to you. Um, it's about that self-activity, that inherent drive to learn and about us supporting um, children to, uh, you know, to uh, develop skill and um, to realise their, uh, their, uh, their plans and their designs um, and also having that skill ourselves. So in a little while, we'll talk a bit more about that. It's also about that idea of unity and connectedness. Um, um, we wouldn't have 
we wouldn't be Frobelian if we didn't have that um, real idea. When I started to look at some literature for um, sewing, it was very much, and for young children, it was very much about kits, about um, projects you could sew. It wasn't about actually the child's self-expression. So I think um, it's really important that um, we see that as part of our, um, uh, you know, part of our role. Um, you know, it's about starting where the children are. Um, so um, thinking about how we can support them at whatever stage um, they are in their holistic um, development. Um, it's about thinking about um, symbols too, about, um, you know, sewing and stitches can be used to represent, um, you know, those inner ideas in an outer form. Um, and it's also, of course, about engaging with nature. So, and we know that children can, you know, can be interested in what fabrics are made of, um, you know, what, um, what we can find in our natural environment that we might be able to sew with, um, thinking about dyes. And also it's um, th starting to think early about, you know, that consum consumerism that we were just talking about um, uh, with the planet's resources. So it has to start with first-hand experiences. So be actually feeling fabrics, um, you know, playing with fabrics. Um, and we know that for some young children, fabrics are very important. So they provide that sort of security, um, you know, cloth and, and comfort um, that, um, you know, might like a like um transition object um that uh, you know babies and young children will find comfort from when they're um separated from their families um we like um you know learning things i think um in, in daily life and and having those real experiences in nursery um i think is really important to a Freudian approach so um so using um, real needle, re, real needles, and um, creating something that's real, um, maybe making that link between um, each other, so that companionable sewing with adults and other children, but also maybe um, as a transition from nursery and home. So you know, making something to take home to show your um, parents. Sewing um, doesn't just um, support children's um, physical development, um, but of course we know that um, that is a very uh, important part of it. Uh, and we need to have that kind of core support um, to be able to use our um, hands um, in those small motor uh, movements. Um, and as we talked about with Esme, the, um, the children often start by threading, um, you know, and when I started to think in more depth about what that actually meant, um, it, it, it shows the real skill and planning that children have to do um, to create even um, a necklace. It's also helps us to start to think about sustainability and how we um, use resources. So um, which resources stay in nursery and which resources um, can go home and we can replace those um, uh, resources. And I know Sharon's going to talk a bit about um, sustainable resources in a minute. So those early skills then of, you know, cutting and threading. And, you know, that's the start of any project. So no matter how old you are, how, um, you know, very young or very old, every project starts with threading a needle. And what an, what an amazing potential for anything to happen after that. So you're, we're privileged at being at the start of that journey uh, with that child. We just don't know where that might go. Um, link back to um, some other of Robel's ideas about, um, you know, those um, kind of practice things that he uh, was almost forced into. Um, the kind of practice cards there that you can see an, exa an example there. Um, but also thinking about, you know, what will support children to be able to achieve the things that they want to do. So one of the things that's quite difficult for young children is when fabric wobbles about. Um, and 
maintaining the tension is, is quite um, key if you want the sewing to be flat. So um, having a, a practice on um, card, like cardboard with or, or um, pieces of card where you can make a hole, children can make their own design and sew in and out. Um, which is much more creative than um, commercially produced um, pieces of, you know, cards and things that are printed. So they can they could make their own designs, and also um, things like uh, bink are really helpful for children to sew in and out, and actually being able to sew in a in a straight line is a really um, useful skill for um, later on. So of course it also it also supports um, you know uh, beyond just physical because we're having conversations we've got a joint project going on where we can just think about um, you know problem solving we can think about vocabulary and their in in context we can think about um, shapes and you know as Esme was talking about those rectangular shapes that are so important and. Uh, the way that cloth is made. Um, we can think about the patterns that are on um, fabrics, um, particularly, um, you know, in Scotland and those um, tartan patterns with the squares and the lines. We can think about length um, and, and, and use it in a real way. How much thread do we need to make a particular um, necklace? Do you need, can you measure it um, on yourself? Just before I say anything more, I would like to say that um, I learned a tremendous amount of about sewing from the two nursery nurses that I worked with, um, Lorraine Donald and uh, Linda McCall. So um, I think that, you know, a lot of the actual practical um, experience I've had, um, I learned with um, them when I was in nursery. And we also hope that children will go on to express themselves um, creatively in their sewing. So um, it might look a bit like scribbling, scribbling initially, um, but, you know, it's the same as in other creative things. We're not necessarily looking at a product. We're looking at, um, you know, that process of doing things. And if children get to the point when they're making a product, what a sense of a achievement, um, you know, that is. Um, and it, I mean, it takes huge amounts of planning um, to, you know, to get to that final product and knowledge about how materials work, what you have to do um, and the skill to actually um, do it. I'm going to leave professional knowledge for Sharon to talk about and now I'm going to invite Tracy um, to give us a few tips for um, practical tips for setting up a sewing area. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. It's quite quiet. Okay, it's not like me. <laughs> there we go. Good. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to really just provide a very brief um, overview of the practicalities of setting up, you know, that invitation to come and sew, that opportunity to sew for young children. And I think you begin as a team, or what I've done with the teams that I've worked with is, is asking a few questions. You know, what resources, obviously, what resources are we going to need? Um, where will the sewing take place? Uh, what will the provision enable the children to do? And, and how do we manage risk within sewing? Because sewing is risky. And we're using needles, we're using pins, we're using scissors. So we need to be able to um, reduce any potential for harm. So that's something to consider as well. So in terms of the resources, that, that's needed. It's really just, um, it, it, it should reflect the interests of the children. It comes back to observing the children and seeing what they're interested in and starting where they are. Um, but basic provision is a small selection of carefully chosen um, resources that are well organised and the small selection and the the well organised is key really because it shows the children what's available so that they can make their own choices and decisions um, but also it encourages the children to take care of, of, of these of these items as well um, everywhere everything has a place so things being returned to where they are enables somebody else to come along and use them um, but also it encourages children to, to manage the risk as well. So needles, when they're not being used, should be in the pincushion or in the needle box. And um, 
involving the children in that from the from the moment they begin to come over to sew, to thread, to weave, whatever it is, it is really important. So I always think starting off with the, I think it's the tapestry needles that are quite blunt uh, at the end and have the nice wide eye at the top, really nice and easy to thread um, and use. And they're quite thick as well, which is good for, for the small hands. Um, a selection of different colored uh, wools, um, yarns, embroidery thread um, is important so the children can decide what, which ones they want to use and also having them organized onto bobbins or um, cotton reels, sp wooden spools is really lovely. I was working with some children today and actually the age and stage where they are, that's what they were excited by, was winding that wool and that yarn onto the bobbin and unwinding it as well. They were quite keen for that sort of sensory exploration. Um, fabric scissors is important, some scissors to cut. So it's nothing more frustrating than going to cut some material and you can't do it. So you need to have some, some good fabric scissors. And also items to thread with, um, beads, buttons, uh, today we were using paper straws cut up into different lengths and they're quite nice and easy uh, and to use and, um, and, and readily available as well. Um, pieces of more open weave fabric um, such as Binka that Jane mentioned earlier or Hessian, uh, they're, they're, they're more rigid, they're easier for the children to handle, there's less movement in them and yeah if you've got some little embroidery hoops you can attach them to that but I mean at the moment I'm, I haven't got those so you don't, they're not a necessity um, and I guess as well a table, a small table nearby to rest things on, to organise the um, resources on um, chairs to sit or cushions to sit on. Those are sort of the resources that, that get you started uh, as well. Um, the other thing to consider is where you're going to do it. Um, are you going to have a designated area for sewing? If you've got maybe a, a, a larger setting, you can have that luxury of having one place where all the sewing things are, or maybe you want something that's portable that you can take out and about. Um, in the setting that I was working in previously, we had decided where the sewing was going to be and actually uh, what we observed was we thought a nice quiet spot it was by the window um it was in a calmer area of the nursery but we observed it really wasn't getting as used as we thought it it might have done and adults weren't going in and out of that we moved it to a busier area which was nearer um sort of the mark make mark marking resources and the home corner and the story area and we found the engagement went up. So actually they weren't bothered about who was around them. They were interested in, in, in just being there in that spot. Um, and actually more adults started to interact with the sewing um, when we moved it there. Um, we found when we took the sewing outside and there's a lovely picture, I think of Magda, who's probably on the call here somewhere on the, on the webinar somewhere. She um, took the provision outside and taking outside, there's the children that spend all day outside and they hadn't really had the opportunity to come, they didn't take the opportunity to come in and so, but once it was taken outside, they came over and that level of engagement and curiosity um, we could see um, from taking that out. At the setting at the moment, we don't have a designated space um, and actually the sewing's not out all the time, we're just introducing it. So it's very much an adult is alongside the children, supporting them and, and building up that familiarity um, with the provision. I don't know how much longer I've got. Can I go on a little I bit think, more, Jane? I think perhaps we should pass on. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so we might, um, you know, you know, we'll pass on to, because um, we do want to have some time for yeah, questions. Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. Okay, that's so good. I mean... Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, Sharon, would you like to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the your community, family, and um, your sewing yeah. bee? Yeah. So I think I think we've talked a lot tonight. There's a real thread running through what we've been saying about um, community and connections and unity relationships. And just showing how much sewing is just a wonderful way to link all our Fribillion principles together. With us at Poppies, we um, began with a small community. Like you said, Jane, I was supported by two others, Debbie and Karen, our wonderful 
sewers. And we were a small community when we started. We didn't have a designated area. We had a box and we just had some sewing materials to start with. And it was just basic. It was um, binka and plastic canvas, really. But because we had that common interest in sewing, we wanted to expand that into our provision and make it much more of a, a feature for the children. But to be able to do that, we also had to have skilled adults able to be with the children and um, to do that. So when we actually spoke about, you know, so you ask questions, Tracy, but I ask questions about actually, do we have sewing skills? Um, and what we found mm -hmm. was that, you know, um, Karen, Debbie and I are of a similar age and we learned to sew at our mum's knee. Um, our younger staff had very little experience or sometimes no experience. So we had to have a look at how we would work with, with that. And um, Karen and Debbie came up with the idea, thanks um, Jane, of the sewing bee. So that's Debbie in the middle there um, with some of our colleagues. And the sewing bee was set up fortnightly in the evening, just straight after work, a chance to have a cuppy, a blether, and actually learn basic skills of sewing and gain some confidence in using a sewing machine. So in doing that, we had staff supported, um, feeling much more confident about their own skills and learning. Um, and that meant that when they went out onto the floor, they could then support children to explore and enjoy and be creative with our materials, with our threads, um, using the fabrics, and then ultimately moving on to using a sewing machine um, and, and doing that together. We then entered into this period of, of lockdown, of course, um, which we've all been part of. But this, I want to talk a little bit about health and well-being in here because, because mm. our sewing bee had been set up, we missed it. So we used lockdown and Zoom classes as a chance to do some extra sewing. And um, that was a way to support our own self, our own health and well-being um, together while still continuing our, our sewing. Um, sewing is such a soothing, quiet satisfying activity and Dr. Alison Clark spoke about holding time in, in um, some of her work and sewing is something that can hold time because you can start a project with a child, you can lay it down, you can come back to it and it can take long periods of time you know or sometimes they may just choose something and, and finish where they are at we've got lots of fabric in the nursery, so we've built up our resources um, over the years. Um, but we do start with our babies. We explore all our fabrics in, in baskets. Some of the photographs um, in the pamphlet actually show some of our babies exploring fabrics and really enjoying it. But as they get a bit older, they then want to be much more um, transformational with the fabric and in particular, the rainbow fabric um, that they're making dens with, sometimes that can be a den, sometimes that can be the mermaid's tail, or we can um, work with um, headbands and scarves. Um, so there's the rainbow material there. So that rainbow material regularly gets used um, as a den, um, but also it's the tail of the mermaid in Julian's um, mermaid story. But my favourite photograph, Jane, if you could go into the one with the scars, um, this is a very simple way um, to, this is my favourite photograph, where they've actually got the stretchy hairbands on round their waists and they've tucked their scars in and they're dancing all around um, in the block area. So yes, it does all move everywhere um, and they're dancing and there's such joy in their faces. Um, as that, that was taken. That is my absolute, absolute favourite um, photograph. So yes, our materials can be really um, transformational um, as, as they play and we leave them to do that themselves with the freedom, um, the freedom to just enjoy the fabric and be creative with it. Um, the most important thing I think when we talk about sustainability 
um, is that we do really want to keep this very, very low cost. So for those of you who may not yet have set up or are just starting to set up, it really can be low cost and we never buy fabric. We never buy materials. We hardly ever buy threads. Everything that we've come by is because as a community, we've talked together about it and people gift us fabrics. So our original, when we went from the box that was just basic, we then um, were gifted a box of remnant fabrics from one of our parents who did so. And it was full of beautiful colours. It was full of foils and velvets and tea towels, um, parts of duvet covers, parts of curtains. And they're just a wonderful resource for children to explore um, and choose their bits and pieces. But the other bit that comes with um, fabrics that's donated is they all come with a story. So there's always a lovely story behind some of the bits and pieces um, that come to us. Um, we also get lots of buttons and beads donated too. So Esme spoke about the necklace making, that, that just really touches my heart when I hear um, that she still loves and recognises her, her beads and making necklaces from when she was young. We're in a real spell of using beads and making necklaces. Even today, um, Meredith made some, um, she's in the, in the photographs and she made a necklace for her dolly um, of, of the beads. It's, it's wonderfully creative when they just take off and they do these things by themselves and just get on with, with it. We have to work to that point, of course, and get there. But also, if we can go to maybe the quilt picture, Jane, if you can see behind me this, so that's the picture of a quilt that one of my parents put together. Now, every piece of fabric, you can see it over my shoulder, every piece of fabric in there came from a child with their own story to tell. And this was gifted to us as our children moved on to primary one. This was our gift. And that in itself tells all their stories because it's so personalized to, to the children and so meaningful um, for us to have that within our nursery. I mean, I've popped it up on the wall for you all to see um, tonight, but actually it sits on the back of our rocking chair and it is, it is something that we're very, very fond of. And we do talk about the children because we actually do know whose piece is whose and, and the importance of, of why they felt that it should be should be in our in our quilt. But I really would encourage anybody who really wants to have a go um, and look at this is to just get other people involved and be part of be part of a sewing community together because you just need to put those feelers out there with your families and before you know it you're going to have fabric coming in your door, you're going to have people picking up beads and things from charity shops, or they'll snip buttons off and give you, I mean, we're at the point now where nobody puts anything away before they run it by us at the nursery to see if we can use it. And I think that's a fantastic way to encourage children to reuse and recycle and do it. So I hope yes. from, from that, people feel that they could really expand on their provision and, and have a go. Thank you, Sharon. I'm going to invite um, Esme to put her camera and um, uh, mic back on and maybe Sasha could um, uh, tell us if there are any questions that people would like to ask. Thank you both. Thank you all. Um, there are lots of questions and um, I'm going to try and cover as many as possible in the seven minutes that we've got left. There's a challenge for you all. Um, I noticed when you were talking uh, through your pamphlet and actually talking generally throughout the webinar that sewing doesn't only encompass a needle and thread and fabric, that you brought to us this idea as encompassing a great deal of exploration and transformation that may never involve a needle and thread. A lot of the questions that we've had have related to inclusion and ways of making sure that perhaps um, adults as well as children who may have reduced dexterity, they may have differing kinds of uh, physical needs, for example, uh, ways of ensuring that they are involved as much as they want to be in 
sewing. So could you talk a little bit more, you've already touched on this throughout the conversation, could you talk a little bit more about ways of in making sure that everyone can be included who wants to be? I think we have to look at resources and also um, including um, staff resources. Um, because it takes planning, I think, to, um, you know, Helen Tovey talks about um, spont you need, it takes planning to be spontaneous. <laughs> so I think having resources to hand and having um, a, a needing to think about how um, staff are going to be deployed to support children, um, you know, is is really is really important. I don't know if Tracy and uh, Sharon would like to add more to that. Um, I would just say it, it does come down to knowing your children, and it's um, you knowing what they potentially can do and, and and providing the support there in the moment really and um, I saw a question come up on the chat about sewing with under three so you know sewing with two-year-olds um yeah I've sewed with two-year-olds we've had needles with them um but you know when you're when you're looking at the the, the risks and, and and around and the inclusion as well it's about making sure that you're meeting everybody's needs and um the opportunities there for everyone. Um, but it does come down to knowing your individual children, really. Thank you. And um, there is an associated question which uh, comes out of a, a very specific question around um, inclusion and uh, inclusion perhaps through creating a sewing club. And the question is really about a balance of structured and unstructured freedom with guidance um so can you talk a little bit about what you've already touched on really about knowing how and when to stand back how and when to step in how and when to um, organize and how and when to allow children to do that organizing or adults to do that organizing for themselves I think also it comes down to that very often we're not looking at a final product um, and, and sometimes, you know, people can expect that there's going to be um, a final product. Um, and actually, for some children, it's actually the process and the experience of it rather than the, um, the actual final thing that they're going to make. So sometimes adults can be disappointed that there's no fine product, um, more so than, um, than, than children. So... Um, I think, you know, if you're setting something up like that, you need to think about what the children are, are, are going to get out of it and um, what are they, how are you really um, involved in their ideas, um, I guess, is what I would say. Um, what about the others, other of you, Sharon or Tracy? I think, I think um, it's, it's, it is similar to what Tracy was saying. You do need to know your children and where, where they're at. You know, we've, we've got children now um, that are very able um, and can sit more or less unsupervised now with just a cast of an eye in that freedom with guidance way that we actually do know our children and we know that they can, they can do some basic bits and pieces by themselves. But that's because we've started way back with threading of beads onto a string. That's a very safe activity and you can do that in a group with your children. And you just kind of get to know the stages of how you move through sewing and where their interests are lying. We've had a lot of interest in threading um, for quite a period of time. They're just very interested in beads. And it is about knowing your children and also having enough adults because it does take away an adult. It does need to be supervised most of the time. And also it's, it's not, about it's, your team, isn't it? It's yes. about your, your team knowing each other so well that it's a bit like what Esme was saying in their team. You know, they work together. Um, so, you know, if you know that a member of staff is um, supporting a child who really, really wants to make something, then other members of the team cannot also be tied down in that way. They've got to be able to move around to respond to um, what other children are doing. So I think it's about knowing your uh, team 
member so well um, that you can um, work with each other um, towards that shared um, understanding of how um, you know supporting all of the children that are there. And I mean, there are times when you're thinking, ah, I really need more pairs of hands. I've not got enough pairs of hands <laughs> um, to, uh, you know, because working with uh, children sewing, they probably are going to need support at some point. So it's um, trying to um, manage that by the way that it's set up, um, um, but also in the in the team. Yeah, and, and even simple things like when you're saying there, Jane, you know, if you, when you're sat sewing with a group of children, you know, three or four at the most. So the number of needles that you have out is for that number and, and, and other children, you know, I've sat today and other children will come over and watch and, you know, they're waiting to come. And it's okay to wait, you know, I think in, in life generally now, things are so quick, aren't they? People expect things quite quickly and, and actually that ability to wait and, and know that you're going to get it and it's not going to go away, it's going to be out again tomorrow um, is a really important message as well. Mm. And, and as yeah. you said, and as, as Esme said, you, they're learning from each other, presumably while they're yeah. closely observing what's happening in, yeah. in the circle of sewers. Yeah. Um, you, you, you've touched on it just there, Tracy, but also um, you in the pamphlet have a whole section on risk and there have been some questions that um, centre on risk. And I'm going to refer uh, the people who asked the question to, to the pamphlet section on risk with apologies for the lack of time uh, to cover that. Um, one, one very last uh, question, um, which uh, I'd like to bring Esme in on, on too is about uh, you, you've said that once you get set, set up Sharon you said for example when people know that you're doing saying so, they'll give you resources well if you're just starting out what's the best thing to do what's the best place to go where do you get your resources from are there any top tips for where to look for those charity shop definitely charity shop and just ask ask your ask your parents any fabrics will be will, would be great. Everybody's got something. We've got old duvet covers. We've got shower screens. We've got all sorts. We've got little cuttings of bits and pieces. And we just never say no, because the more we have, the more we can explore. Yeah, yeah, great. Esme, did you want to, to add anything to that? Because obviously you gather things from all around the world. Uh, uh, have you got any top tips? Um, oh, have I? Um, well, like you were talking about children and they make a little community and that whole thing about us on computer, where sewing, you're feeling, you're touching, you're creating something and, you know, you've got time to be in your own head. Mm. Um, I think that's really important. And you step back, just solving problems. I feel it's really good for your mental health. And I'm sure it's the same for small children. I'm, it was for me being creative. And, you know, it's, I think it's very important. Absolutely. It does seem to me a very therapeutic activity um, <laughs> once you've got the swing of it. <laughs> so um, I'm well, really also, sorry. You're, sorry, sorry, you're no, solving honestly. problems. You know, even as a tiny child threading a needle, that's your problem. How are you going to thread it? Well, you learn and then you'll go on to the next thing. Absolutely. Well, thank you all immensely for tonight. It's been a pleasure listening to you all. Um, I've learned lots um, and um, I'm... Uh, going to as I say hope everybody will have a look at your your pamphlet which can be downloaded for free from our website um, if you're not watched the great British sewing bee go ahead and have a look because it's fabulous and um, have a go if you haven't already and thank you ever so much all of you for joining us um, for this webinar tonight please join us for the next event which is on the 9th of February